Okay, so this is chapter one, which is the introduction. So I'm just going to go in here. Okay, so the definition of forensic science, it's really just the application of science to criminal and civil laws. Okay, so it's criminal and civil law. And it's they're really using the scientific method. So the book emphasize the application of science to those criminal and civil laws that are enforced by police agencies in a criminal justice system. So we're talking about what, um, I guess, the law, basically. Okay, now, there's history. Okay, so we always, in the first chapter, we always get history of whatever we're studying. So and I'm not, I hope I don't butcher their names, but Matthew or Phil, or Phila, I think he's the father of forensic toxicology. So forensic toxicology, so that means that he actually started in the early 1800s, and he worked on how poisons affect animals and how they can be detected. So forensic toxicology, that kind of makes sense, right? So the poisons and how they affect animals. So he's the one that really got it all started. Okay, now... In 19, or 1879, Alphonse Bertillon, he came up with a scientific system of identifying people. Okay, so they say they devised the first scientific system of personal, personal identification. So he used, and I have the picture on the next slide, he used body measurements, and they called it anthropology. Metry, okay, so anthropo, so it would be like people, and metry would be measurements. Okay, so he used body measurements to distinguish one person from another. So in the book, there is a figure, and it's his system of bodily measurements that are used for the identification of an individual. So it has an individual, and it's the individual is standing and sitting and leaning and they're measuring all of his body parts. So they're measuring how tall he is, they're measuring how wide his wingspan is, how tall he would be sitting, how big his head is, how big his face is, how big his feet are, how long his arms are, and like his reach and things like that. So Bertillon came up with a, a very scientific and thorough way of looking at body measurements and trying to identify people by like, predicting how, how big they are. Okay, now Galton came in, Francis Galton, so he was about in the early 1900s, so we're moving forward in time. He was the first person that did like a scientific, and they say a de definitive study of fingerprints. So other people were before him were thinking, oh, fingerprints would work. I think everyone's fingerprints are different. But Galton developed a, a systematic way of looking at fingerprints and classifying them. Okay, now Leon Lattes, which I, that's probably not pronounced right, but that's what it looks like. So Lots. In 1915, okay, he, he kind of worked, he, he, he benefited from the work of the first person to identify blood types. Okay, so the person that identified blood types, now I can't ever remember people's names, so that's bad. The blood type per guy, I'm trying to find his name. The blood type guy starts with an L. Oh, shoot. Oh, well, I'll find it. I'll tell you guys in, in lecture. Oh, uh, Landers, Landsteiner. Okay, so Landsteiner, I'll, I'll try to write it on here. Landsteiner is the first person to, he figured out blood typing. Okay, so he figured out how blood types work, which we're, we're going to talk about. And then this guy, Leon Lade, he um, developed a way to figure out blood type from dried blood stains. Okay, so the two, I call, like, I think of them as the two L's. So the two L's had to do with blood typing. Okay, now Goddard, which is not the same Goddard as the rocket place. Okay, so Goddard, 
started taking advantage of the idea of microscopes. So microscopes were developed probably in the 17, 1800s, but in the 1900s, he, um, he started using a comparison microscope. So you can look at two things at one time. So you could have two different specimens and he used comparison microscopy to determine if a gun fired a bullet. We don't have a comparison microscope, but we have some, um, we could do it with our, um, we have tablets that we could hook up that I think we could try to compare. It might be interesting. Okay, now Albert Osborne, he is the person that developed um, the idea of how you can examine documents. So he developed the fundamental principles of document examination. So this is kind of like a laundry list of people, but he, he was documents. So like lab, looking at letters, looking at handwriting, looking at, you know, the ink, that kind of thing. Okay, then Macron, he started using microscopes because microscopes were becoming more advanced. So he started using microscopes and other analytical science tools to look at any kind of evidence. So it could be biological, it could be geological, so it could be looking at hair, he could be looking at soils, he could be looking at glass. Okay, now Hans Gross, he wrote the first treaty that he, he really applied scientific principles to criminal investigation. So he really tried to make it a science. It's just not the idea that you're going in and observing, you're comparing things, and, and it's going to be valid and reliable. Okay, now Lockhart, he was the first one to establish a lab. So he, he took the ideas of gross and he was able to implement them in a space. Okay, the, the oldest forensic lab is in um, Los Angeles. So the LAPD has the oldest lab, but the biggest lab is at the FBI in Quantico. So Quantico, Virginia. Okay, now um, Lockhart came up with this exchange principle. So in this, if you think about it, this makes sense. So the exchange principle basically states that when a criminal comes in contact with an object or a person, a cross transfer of evidence occurs. So if you come in contact with something, you leave a mark or you leave evidence that you were there. Okay, so it could be DNA, it could be hair, it could be a footprint. Okay, so that's Lockhart's exchange principle. All right, so the increasing number of crime labs in the United States or in the world is, is due to several things. Right, so, so the increasing one of the, number one of the of big crime things labs is the idea in the United that States or um, in the world confessions is, is due to several are things. Not so admissible. One of the as one of the big things evidence is that the idea that. Or, um, Someone confessions did the crime are okay, so, or not that someone was guilty. Admissible so confessions needed to be demonstrated with more than just someone completed a person's or words. So someone did um, the crime in the sixties. Okay, the so Supreme that someone was Court, guilty. all their so confessions needed to be demonstrated they with more than required just police a to put words. more so emphasis on um, in the sixties. The Supreme Court okay, and having all their decisions evidence they. Required okay, police the crime to put labs more also became on inundated with data, drug specimens, okay, having okay, scientifically so evaluated you can't, evidence. Um, okay, now educate the crime labs put, also put became inundated or inundated with drug specimens. Or even, um, okay, so you can't I guess arrest someone um, of a drug educate charge put, unless you can put, prove that they actually have or drugs. Try so or even um, you know if they have. Baby powder arrest it's not someone it's not something of a that drug is worth charge unless you can prove right? that they actually so have there's more drugs. drug abuse there's so, more drug crimes you know, if they have and baby then powder, another thing that not, has created not a backlog something that is worth is all the DNA time, evidence right? that exists so there's more drug abuse so that there's just more another, drug crimes another aspect of and it. then another thing that has created a backlog is all of the DNA evidence that exists so that's just another another aspect of it.
Okay, now, um, what's kind of weird is that the crime labs in the United States are very decentralized. They're not co coordinated at a national level at all. Um, there are labs at the federal level, at the state level, at the county level, and at the municipal level. And they all support their specific um, like police or law enforcement agency. So at the federal level, I'm going to go forward. I can't remember if I have this in the slide or not. At the federal level, there's FBI. There are four labs at the federal level. So there's the FBI. There's the DEA. There's the Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, so F A T F E, and then the Postal Service also has a lab. So the Postal Service lab is going to look for things that are violating laws that have things that have been sent through the post office, which that's kind of different, huh? Okay, so there's just all these different levels, and there's not one agency that's totally in charge of it. Okay, now, there's five basic science, um, basic services that crime labs provide. So there's a physical science unit. So that's got chemistry, physics, geology, and they're going to compare physical evidence. Okay, so that's pretty general. We're going to go over that in lab. Biology unit, so they're going to do biology, right? So biological science. So they'll look at blood samples, they'll look at body fluids, They'll look at hair. They'll look at fibers. Um, firearms. So they're going to look at bullets, cartridge casings, shotgun shells. They'll look at amu ammunition. Document unit. They're going to look at handwriting analysis and other um, document kind of issues. So like maybe what kind of printer was it on? Did they... Where was the envelope stamped if it was something that was mailed? Um, there's a photographic unit. So they're going to use um, specialized photographic techniques for recording and examining physical evidence. So five basic services. So physical science, biology, firearms, document, and, and documenting things with um, photographs. Okay, now optional services, so toxicology. So toxicology, they're going to look for drugs or poisons in body fluids or organs. Latent fingerprint unit, so they'll look for fingerprints that have been left somewhere. A polygraph unit, so they're going to do the lie detector tests, which are known as polygraph. Voice print analysis unit, so they're going to... Um, try to tie a recorded voice, so something that's been recorded like on a phone or some other means to a, to a suspect. And then there's the evidence collection unit. So these are people that are just specialized to go to the crime scene and collect and preserve the evidence. That, that's, those kind of make sense, right? Pretty logical. Okay, now more specialized units are forensic psychiatry. Okay, so they're going to look at the relationship between human, human behavior and legal proceedings. Forensic odontology is teeth. Okay, so it's a way to identify victims because teeth is a personal identification feature. They're, they're, very, they're unique to, to people. So they could be used to identify like a mass casual, people from a mass, mass casualty event or they could be used in bite wounds something like that. Okay, forensic engineering, they look at failure analysis. So like, uh, why did the building fall the way it did? Okay, there was a bomb here, but why did the building collapse the way that it did? They might also look at accident reconstruction and causes, they're also under causes and origins of fires and explosion. And then um, forensic computer science. So they're going to use digital digital evidence. So there's a bunch of different different things on there. Okay, now a forensic scientist is supposed to be able to take the principles and techniques of physical and natural sciences and apply them to the analysis of many types of evidence that could be recovered during an investigation. 
So they're going to do science to understand the evidence from an investigation. Okay, now, um, there are in, in this book there are several court cases or decisions that describe, like, kind of like tra trace the, I guess, trace the history of how things are admissible in court. Okay, so the first that one that we have is the is Fry versus United States. So that decision um, set the guidelines for determining whether scientific evidence could be admissible in the courtroom. So who, it's how they decide whether something can actually be used. So every time a new technique comes up, they want to see, is it valid? Is it reliable? Can is it useful? Is it accepted? So. The Fry standard, the evidence in question, must be generally accepted by the scientific community. So you can't just pull some crazy idea to scientifically demonstrate someone can, is guilty of a crime and present it to a judge and have it be accepted as evidence. Okay, so it's got to, there's got to be backup information to it. Okay, now, in 1993... Daubert versus Merrill Dow Pharmaceutical, what they said is that the U.S. Supreme Court asserted that the Fry standard is not an absolute prerequisite to the admissibility of scientific evidence. So what Daubert versus Dow says is that um, the judges are said to be the gatekeepers for the admissibility and validity of scientific evidence. So you can't admit everything. The judges actually are the gatekeepers to make sure whether a scientific theory has been tested, if the technique has been subject to peer review, um, if the technique has a high error rate, you know, if there are standards in there, and whether the theory has been accepted by the community. So the judge looks over all of that before they accept the evidence. Okay, so, wait a minute, I think I just said what I, I, I have typed out what I just said. So in Daubert, the scientific, the Supreme Court offered some guidelines as to how a judge can gauge scientific evidence. So you look at whether the technique or theory has been tested, whether the technique or theory has been subject to peer review and publication, the technique's potential rate of error, and um, whether there are standards, so standards would be like a control, or whether, you know, I guess, like standards are always, in my mind, they're a control. So they're going to make sure that the, the test is reliable. And then whether the scientific community has accepted this, this um, experiment or this method. I hope that all makes sense. Okay, now, a forensic science may also provide expert court testimony. So an expert witness is an individual who the court determines possesses knowledge relevant to the trial, and they have knowledge that is not expected of the average person. Okay, so they have more than your average person has. Okay, so the expert witness is going to be called on to evaluate evidence based on specialized training and experience that the court doesn't have the expertise to do. Okay, the expert will then express an opinion as to whether the findings are significant or not. Okay, so the necessity for the forensic scientist to appear in court has been imposed on the criminal justice system by the case of Melendez Diaz versus Massachusetts. Okay, so that's where the forensic scientist started to become an expert witness and they, they come in and start talking about what they know. And, well, never mind. I'm babbling. Okay, now, evidence collection training is one of the last slides. So lots of big crime labs have evidence technicians. So these are people that are trained by the, the crime lab staff, and they're on 24-hour call. So if there's a crime, they will go out and collect the evidence. So they go out to the field 
So the training that they get ensures that all pertinent evidence will be recognized so they'll know what they're looking for and they'll be able to collect it. Okay, so there's no formal training for evidence collection, but you can become familiar with it through um, lectures, tours of the lab, and evidence collection manuals. So they'll have like a standard operating procedure that they use to follow. So, and um, how we're going to, next week in lab, we'll do an exercise where we, um, we're going to collect evidence and look at a crime scene. So in Appendix 1 in the book, there's information about how we actually collect and package evidence.